Okay. Um, hello, and thank you so much for joining us at Hudson Institute. Um, unfortunately, we all know why we are meeting here today. Um, it's because the Hong Kong government is engaging in some of the most pernicious forms of intimidation. It's because the Hong Kong government is more afraid of its people than it is of almost anything else. And it's because the Hong Kong government no longer stands on the side of freedom. Today, I'm sharing the stage with Francis Hoy. Um, I worked with Francis in my previous capacity at the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation, but she is more than just a former colleague. She's also a friend. Um, Francis is no criminal. Um, she is a committed defender to the cause of freedom, and she should not have a Hong Kong one Hong Kong dollar one million yeah. bounty on her head or a warrant out for her arrest. But here we are today. She's an asylee here in the U.S., and she deserves the utmost protection uh, at, from the U.S. government and guarantees of her safety. My other friend, Joey Sue, who unfortunately could not join us here today, was also targeted yesterday by a bounty. Um, I've known Joey for years, and I can speak to the dedication that she has not only to the cause of freedom in Hong Kong, but to freedom around the globe and in China specifically. Um, I remember joining arms with Joey in particular, calling for Beijing not to be able to host the 2022 uh, Olympics in Beijing, and she was a tireless advocate and an important voice in that cause. And just like Francis, she does not deserve to have a warrant out for her arrest. She does not deserve to have a bounty on her head. Hong Kong is not the bright spot in Asia that it once wa was, and the bounties are further proof of that. It's, you know, as if we needed any further proof of how precipitously freedom has declined there. Um, and one of the more notable parts of the bounty is that many of the accused are targeted for their work to get good policies that safeguard freedom in Hong Kong done. In fact, I believe um, one of the bills that was recently introduced in the US Congress um, targeting judges and prosecutors for their, the role that they've played in the degradation of freedom in Hong Kong is one of the reasons why Francis has been targeted. And I think it's, this bill has earned the ire of the Hong Kong government because they know what it means. If judges and prosecutors are sanctioned, they're held accountable for undermining rule of law there. Um, and I think it's just further proof to all of us who are, are looking on um, of just how far Hong Kong has truly fallen from grace. Um, I don't want to bore anyone or tire anyone anymore because I know the main reason that you all have come here is to hear from both Francis and from Piero. Um, Francis is the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation. She also leads a group, We the Hong Kongers, which is dedicated to strengthening Hong Konger culture and identity abroad. Um, she's also affiliated with the Dissidents Project, and when I worked with her in my previous role, I always loved how um, she would share about the fact that she's been an advocate for freedom in Hong Kong since the age of 14, um, alongside Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow working in scholarism. Um, and she rarely says this, but in addition to her incredible advocacy and having lived through everything in Hong Kong, she's also a, a really excellent policy expert on the Hong Kong cause. Um, we're also joined by the staff director for the Congressional Executive Commission on China, Piero Tazi. Um, prior to joining CECC, Piero has held a number of senior positions with the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health and Global Human Rights, and International Organization. I think I got that. I think <laughs> name, you did. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and also senior roles in the personal office of Representative Chris Smith. He received his undergraduate degree from Columbia and his law degree from Fordham University. And beyond that, I had the privilege of serving as his son Peter's um, supervisor in my previous job uh, at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I wish that we were coming together under better circumstances, but it's still my joy and delight to be able to welcome you to the Hudson Institute stage. Um, so Francis, without further ado, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um I do prepare, I didn't prepare a statement to say, but I want to first start off by thanking Olivia and Hassan Institute for um, pulling this event together so quickly and, you know, lend this platform for me to share my, um, you know, my story and um, what's going on right now with the bounties and, and the situation in Hong Kong. Um, so yesterday I awoke to the news that I was um, 
being placed with a bounty with a million dollar um, Hong Kong dollar bounty on my head. And the arrest warrant is for my efficacy in the US, and in particular, my role in calling for sanctions, um, as well as engaging in what they call hostile activities against the People's Republic of China. Um, one can easily imagine that it is, has to do with the recently introduced Hong Kong Sanction Act, a bill that I have taken part in developing, which named 49 Hong Kong officials, judges, prosecutors, who are involved in the crackdown on Hong Kong civil liberties and freedom for US sanction. Um, in July 2020, I left Hong Kong to seek asylum in the US and eventually became the first Hong Kong activist to, to secure asylum in the US based on evidence persecution by the CCP. It has then become certain that I will no longer be able to return to Hong Kong where I was born and raised, and a day like yesterday will come to me eventually. Through my decade-long activism, I have witnessed and experienced the extent of the CCP's harassment and intimidation of people who hold different views of them. This is not just with fellow Hong Kongers, but also Tibetans, Uyghurs, and other Chinese dissidents, all of whom are targeted simply for supporting democracy and freedom and speaking up for their rights. It is nevertheless what I and many of the people who have been charged with violating the national security law have been doing in Hong Kong and abroad, to call for freedom for our beloved city, Hong Kong, but also for uh, my fellow Hong Kongers and our dear friends among the thousands who are currently being held in prison for doing that exact same thing. The Hong Kong government deliberately took a high-profile way to issue bounties for the arrest of overseas activists, not for no reason. They wanted to create a chilling effect on the community at large and to isolate us. The issuance of bounties on overseas Hong Kongers, the recent arrests of people who supported them, as well as the pattern of coercing imprisoned Hong Kongers to confess on city-wise TV channels are all signs that the Hong Kong government is adopting more and more Beijing-style tactics in controlling human rights and freedom. Today, while we're discussing on Hong Kong here, the truth is the situation in Hong Kong has not gotten better since the implementation of the national security law in 2020. In fact, the government has continued to unleash egregious acts in violating people's freedom and human rights. And the silence and inadequate action by the international community is what have enabled this. It is a reflection of a failure in our policy and a lack of multilateral cooperation with other democratic allies to hold the CCP accountable. And for these reasons, I will continue to advocate for the sanctioning of Hong Kong officials and their mouthpieces. I will keep calling for the release of political prisoners in Hong Kong and for the CCP to be held accountable for violating the Hong Kong basic law and human rights. And in my role as a community organizer, I will continue to dedicate my, sec my other half to strengthening the diaspora community, as well as preserving and promoting Hong Kong's precious culture abroad. Um, this announcement also came in a very difficult time for me. Um, today, I was supposed to use the day to grieve and mourn the passing of my grandmother. And this is one of the things that <clears throat> many of us in exile have to accept and cope with, which is the chances of not being able to spend time and be there for people who hold weights in our lives. Um, but I must emphasize that while living abroad for the past few years, I have been financially independent and have received no support from my family and extended family. Whether it was in Hong Kong or abroad, I have never discussed with them any of the work related to social issues and political engagement. So if the regime seek to threaten and pressure me through them, it will be in vain. Mm. I would also like to offer my solidarity to all those who have had bounties placed on them and support their courage in standing up to the CCP. I sincerely thank my colleagues, co-workers, and friends who have reached out to offer support and comfort during this unsettling time. And once again, I call on the international community, particularly the US, the UK, and Australia, where the bounty individuals are residing, 
to fight against the CCP's transnational repression, interference, and international human rights abuses. I also urge everyone to remember those who continue to resist in prisons and courtrooms in Hong Kong. In the spirits of Hong Kongers' persistence, I will keep on fighting. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Francis, for the, those incredibly moving remarks and also for your bravery in continuing to speak up. I think you know, that is one of the things that I've noticed since the bounties first began earlier this year is that you know, the Hong Kong government may have a goal of silencing people, but Hong Kongers are not going to be silent in the face of injustice. And I think you're a perfect example of that, but also our friends, you know, Anna at Hong Kong Democracy Council is, is another great testament to this and the other folks, as you mentioned, who are targeted in, yeah. in other countries. So, and also um, condolences for your grandmother. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine what a difficult time that is for you personally. Um, Piero, I would love to hand it over to you to hear sure. a little bit no. more. Yeah, no, thank you, Olivia, and thank you, Francis. You're, you're really so brave, and, and, uh, and as Olivia said, condolences as well. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're such an example, and at such a young age, and you know, what tremendous leadership you have. I want to, uh, reflecting and commenting on this, I think there are a couple of things that are very evident in what has happened. And one is the erosion of rule of law in Hong Kong and the complicity of officials in Hong Kong, of, of prosecutors, of judges in that uh, erosion. A and what we see is not you know, a rule of law, but rule by law, and using law as a tool uh, to harass and intimidate. And in violation of that basic law, which was the Hong Kong's mini constitution that was supposed to guarantee liberties, and this is due to the influence uh, and control of, uh, of Beijing and of the Chinese Communist Party. So it's, I think, very clear the passage of this draconian national security law that's used to harass and oppress people such as Francis and, and Joey and Anna. Uh, the other thing, though, I think is what we are seeing here is that long arm of China, that transnational repression of the Chinese Communist Party that's directed at Chinese people in the diaspora, people such as Francis, uh, people uh, that are citizens of the Republic of China uh, from ethnic minority groups like Uyghurs and Tibetans, uh, but also uh, Han Chinese themselves, uh, religious practitioners, Falun Gong practitioners uh, living abroad. And what we are seeing are these instruments of transnational repression. Um, we're seeing uh, these consulates of Beijing, that the, the allegation, this is something that needs to be, I think, investigated, that are involved in coordinating that. And also, uh, people don't know that Hong Kong itself has what are called Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices here. And it, it, initially, it was thought that they, you know, when the handover occurred, that these would be independent oases uh, separate from Beijing. But what has increasingly happened is that they've become outposts of the Chinese Communist Party and have been involved in the tracking of Hong Kong dissidents, people like Francis, Anna, over here. And they have become long arms of repression. We also saw something that, that happened that was really shocks the conscience in our own country. And that was uh, last month at the APEC summit in San Francisco, where you had Xi Jinping, the red carpet was rolled out for him. Uh, you had not just our political leaders, but also business leaders who paid $40,000 to sit at a table with Xi Jinping and who gave him two standing ovations here. This is somebody who is engaged in some of the most egregious human rights practices. Now, you had members of the Chinese diaspora. You had members from Hong Kong, Tibetans, Uyghurs, uh, uh, others who are democracy advocates who are protesting, exercising their First Amendment freedoms. What happened to them was horrible. They were beaten. They were uh, attacked by what apparently were uh, agents of the Chinese Communist Party there. They, they were carrying Chinese flags with flagpoles. They used those flagpoles to, to, to beat them. We just had a press conference in Congress where some of these victims came and spoke and told about what they had undergone. And, and what is really terrible is that apparently the San Francisco Police Department did nothing to protect them. And apparently there were orders 
to stand down. So one thing that we're doing at the, 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 the China Commission is calling upon our Department of Justice and our FBI to investigate this. We're also, Congress is taking action to protect and defend Francis and others uh, like her. Um, there are a number of bills. There's, Olivia mentioned the sanctions bill, which uh, uh, two CECC commissioners, Senator Merkley and Senator Sullivan, have, have introduced uh, there, which lists a number of, of uh, Hong Kong officials that are complicit in these violations. Actually, it's very gratifying to see that a lot of the work that the CECC has done in a couple of reports, and refer people to our website, cecc.gov, uh, for these reports that look at uh, Hong Kong judges and Hong Kong prosecutors and their um, uh, their role in eroding rule of law. Also a hearing that we did in May um, which featured Sebastian Lai, the son of, of Jimmy Lai. Jimmy Lai is a uh, an outstanding figure, a man of faith and conviction, a former newspaper publisher, entrepreneur, but someone who stood, stood for democracy. Right now his trial starts on Monday. He's being prosecuted for that, and it's you know it's likely he'll be convicted and possibly die in, in prison. But he's a, a, a man of tremendous faith and and conviction who needs our support. Jimmy is like the the, the grandfather to the uh, uh, Hong Kong democracy, the former publisher of Apple Daily, the last major free uh, newspaper in 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 Hong Kong. But one thing to note is how young so many of the people that are targeted, how young you are, Francis, and how wise you are for all your, your, your years, but also Joey Sui, you know, how young she is and how brave. And she's also was named with, the, with you and a bounty was put on her head. And Anna Kwok, mm. too, who the, previously was targeted and put a bounty on her, on her head. And if people just think about that, you can't go home. You can't go to, back to Hong Kong. You can't see your family. And you, it's so sad and touching, but you, know, that you, you can't mourn even that that's been, been denied you, and just tremendously, tremendously brave. Um, we also have introduced legislation. I mentioned these Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices that would um, authorize the president to shut them down. Because again, these are just adjuncts of, of the PRC that are engaged in transnational repression. And it also, the legislation would prevent entities, US government entities, from engaging, contracting with these Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices. In an incident that happened last year, the Smithsonian Institute held this uh, Jazzy Starry Nights uh, concert. And this was part of the Hong Kong uh, uh, efforts to, um, basically propaganda efforts, to tell businesses, come back to Hong Kong, invest in Hong Kong. It's business as usual. Well, here we have the Smithsonian Institute that was complicit in that, in this, this propaganda effort. So this bill would ban that from, from happening. And then another important piece of legislation we have is the Transnational Repression Policy Act. And again, it's a, just like the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices Act, it's a four corners, we call it CECC document. It has both, in, in the House, it's uh, Chairman Smith, in the Senate, it's Co-Chairman Merkley, and then our ranking members, uh, Congressman Jim McGovern and, and Senator Rubio have introduced both these pieces of legislation. And I think one of the important things that the Transnational Repression Act would, would do is to create a reporting on China and other authoritarian regimes, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, their actions here to coerce and intimidate uh, Americans, you know, li people living in the United States. And um, it, it's, I think, something that unfortunately is very necessary. Mm -hmm. So anyway, with that, I, you know, we can maybe segue to the questions and answers. Yeah. But just thank you, Francis, thank so you much for your, 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 your bravery. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Likewise. Thank you, Pierre. You gave us, like, such a great vision of the landscape of what is out there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's really helpful because I think every time that we're faced with something as egregious as like bounties being issued right. or, you know, you mentioned the APAC summit, individuals being physically targeted, yeah. um, you're left there sitting, sitting there and asking yourself, like, what can be done? And so I think it's so helpful to be able to hear those answers. And I, I hope throughout our um, question and answer that we can dig into that and delve into that a little bit more. Um, and I, I did want to comment one other thing that you mentioned, Piero, about rule of law. 
I feel like this concept of rule of law is what brings all of the potential stakeholders who could be forces for good in the Hong Kong context together. Mm. If you're a business person, for example, and you don't have the guarantee of the rule of law for doing business, you don't think that you're going to have a fair day in court if you have some sort of like legal dispute in a business context, it, it's very difficult to do business. If government knows that there isn't a rule of law, that's really challenging because it's constantly a sliding scale for you know, what you're safeguarding and what you're not safeguarding. And at an individual level, you know, all of us care about at the heartstrings level the fact mm. that civil liberties and, and civil and political liberties have been utterly undermined mm. in Hong Kong since you know, 2020 when the national security law went into effect. And we're now seeing that the Hong Kong government, and let's be real, the distinction between the Hong Kong government and the Chinese Communist Party is becoming smaller and smaller day by day. Mm. The bounties are just yeah. evidence of that. Um, you know, I think that we are realizing that the undermining of rule of law isn't just happening yeah. in Hong Kong, it's happening now extraterritorially. And so it involves every single government actor, every single like, you know, person who is a member of civil society, every single individual who believes in freedom to say, I'm gonna take a stand on Hong Kong because there are implications for freedom elsewhere if Beijing and the Hong Kong government get away with this yeah. sort of of actions. Um, my first question is related to transnational repression um, because, you know, as our, our friend Sophie Richardson, formerly of Human Rights Watch, um, said recently at a, a CFHK uh, conference, actually, on the Hill, um, she said, you know, transnational repression is this very fancy word. Mm -hmm. and sometimes people sit there and say, what is transnational repression? And when you really dig down deep, when you get to the heart of it, it's ordinary crimes easily defined in US law. Mm -hmm. Harassment, intimidation, physical harm, um, you know, battery and assault um, has happened. Um, these are very clearly defined in US and a lot of international. Assassination attempts. Assassination too. attempts, w threats Weijing of Sheng, rape. Probably the most important Chinese dissident uh, yeah. there. Uh, yeah, uh, threats of rape and sexual violence. I mean, just yep. the, you, you name it, these threats have been made against activists as recently as like the past month. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I'm just curious, um, you know, Francis, you've experienced transnational repression, not just through the bounties, but also through other experiences. Um, I don't know if you'd be willing to share a little bit about those, but also talk about what can be done. I know, Piero, you already started talking about some of the legislation on the mm -hmm. Hill, but are there other things that the U.S. government should be considering as well? Yeah, so I can share a little bit of what happened to me in 2019, which um, at that time, I was still a student in Boston, and I remember um, because of the movement happening back in Hong Kong, um, I kind of took up in the role of like organizing rallies, um, protests around um, the world. And so in the coordination of it, I also organized a, a rally in Boston. And throughout the time when I was organizing these rallies, I was being uh, tailed. Like one time I was tailed to my dorm, um, and I, I got death threats from actually my, my um, you know, schoolmates in the same school and the same college. And from my knowledge, no one has gotten any trouble from that. The school administration didn't hold the student accountable. There were no uh, consequences? No. Um, and a statement put out from the school was to say that, you know, we respect everyone's um, freedom of speech. Um, and we asked the students to do so as well. And there's no condemnation made by the school. Um, this, this happened in 2019, which at that time, I guess the US, uh, you, you know, the, the, the wider um, public hasn't really been aware of this, you know, the problems, threats of CCP. Um, but more into it is, a, a, in a lot of the colleges in the US, perhaps in other countries as well, um, colleges receive a lot of tuition from Chinese students. Mm. In my school, 70% of the international students are Chinese. Mm. Um, and so it made it even more challenging for me as a Hong Konger or my friends who were Uyghurs, Tibetans, or um, Taiwanese, um, Chinese mainlander um, who hold different views. Um, mm. Many of them are not willing um, or they're scared to speak up in their classrooms even though they're in the US. 
Um, and so these kind of transnational repression, um, I think the chilling effects applies to everywhere, extend, you know, a, a, you know, um, you know ex ex exceed the border of China. Mm -hmm. um, everyone here is feeling being watched, and they are not, they don't, don't feel comfortable to speak up, whether mm -hmm. it's in the US or in China or in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that time, I, I wanted to use my voice to you know, kind of speak up for them, but then what I got is more harassment and intimidation. Um, and I was being spied um, by, by actually Chinese agents. Um, and we found that out in 20, uh, actually last year, when the FBI um, finally um, indicted one of the people, just one of the people who were involved in uh -huh. spying over my activities. But from my knowledge, there are a lot more people that were involved, and they were able to get away from it. And so I think, you know, we um, also, Piero just mentioned in the, you know, during the APAC summit in San Francisco, it's, it's crazy to see that the local authorities, um, you know, the police are not really um, putting their time and efforts in, in protecting the people who were protesting there peacefully mm. um, and letting the people who were violently attacking other um, protesters to go away. Um, and I think this is a problem that we're facing here in, I, I think, in local governments as well is that, you know, we need to, you know, increase the protection to everyone um, across the country. Not just, you know, we're now I'm in the in in, in D.C. I feel perhaps a, a little more safer with friends around me who know the cause. But what about, you know, some other friends who are living in, um, you know, a city that doesn't know anything about the CCP? Yeah. Um, but the fact, you know, the, the truth is, CCP's. Um, long arms is everywhere. Yeah. Um, and how are we able to um, educate the public to um, understand that? I think that's uh, 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 something that we need to think about. Yeah, and you know, the thing that really stands out to me, for instance, is when you, like, because I've heard you share your experience um, at the college in Boston that you were at before, is that like school is supposed to be a, mm. like, place of community and of safety. And to and, discuss and learn freely. Yes, yeah. to discuss and to learn freely. And that wasn't your experience. Um, and you weren't offered the protections that you should have been offered. And so like shame on the school for, for not having done that. And I think this is a reminder also, you know, to folks who are thinking about what they can do as an individual. Like if you're a part of a school setting, come to the defense of fellow students mm. when something happens, like what happened to you, Francis. But also, you should press school administrations to make sure that they are standing up when threats of physical violence were issued against you. Um, so I think that's, that's so important. Thank you for sharing about that. Um, and then for either of you, are there additional kind of recommendations or solutions um, on transnational repression specifically? Well, I, I think, Part of what the Transnational Repression Policy Act does is to address this. And one very important component, and you just really are so brave. I mean, think about that. No, I mean, to, to, to go out there and to endure these attacks, and but to stand for, for what is right and just, tremendously brave. But it, what we need to do is, and, and our local law enforcement needs to support this. So, so part of what I think needs to be done is education. Education of, of uh, state's attorneys general, education of, of local law enforcement, local prosecutors, so that they recognize, and you're right, it's a fancy name for something that amounts to harassment and intimidation, mm. okay? And the laws need to be enforced. You can't turn the other way and look at it as happened in, 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 in San Francisco. So that's one thing. But there also, I think, has to be outreach and sensitivity towards the diaspora communities. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes, uh, people come here to this country, there are language barriers, even students, at the university who come from uh, China or from, from, from Hong Kong, um, th th they often uh, take with them sort of that fear, that feeling of, of fear. And they don't realize that the, the panoply of rights that are guaranteed under our, our Constitution. And you, I think you hit the nail right on the head, the complicity of our universities you know, for, for financial gain in overlooking this abuse of the freedom of, of expression, of inquiry. I mean, that's what the university is supposed to be. 
a place where people can freely ex express their ideas. We've, one of the things that's been addressed over the past few years is these uh, Confucius Institutes, um, these um, uh, soft power uh, institutes that were set up in university campuses that were funded by the Chinese government. What is interesting, and, and we conducted that when I was over in the Foreign Affairs Committee, we had a couple of hearings on, on how does this impact academic freedom. And there were certain t topics, the three T's, for example, that couldn't be discussed. That's Tibet, yeah. Taiwan, and Tiananmen Square, the <laughs> Tiananmen Square massacre. And there were other issues as, as well. And you also had oftentimes these instructors who came from China who themselves were, were repressed. They had contracts, and we looked at this, and I actually was, was um, when I used to, uh, before I came to the Hill and, and had a, a practice law, you had um, contracts that said that uh, women uh, could not be pregnant and if they in violation of the one-child policy at the time. And if they were, they would be sent back uh, there. So you had this sort of long-arm repression even of, of faculty at these, these Confucius Institutes. Um, but we also have what are uh, you know, these Chinese Students and Scholars Associations uh, in our university campuses that work very closely with the Chinese embassy. And they monitor other Chinese students, you know, so that they, uh, if they voice opinions that are contrary to, you know, party dogma or, or, or doctrine, they get reported. So there's this feeling of, of this of fear and intimidation that occurs on our university campuses. So this needs to be be be, be addressed. And we also see so much of, I think, what was revealed. So safeguard defenders and their reports on these overseas uh, police stations. Um, that we've seen in New York and Boston, for example, but all around the world, um, you have these uh, unofficial uh, uh, outposts of the Chinese Communist Party, and some of it's uh, not just on the central governmental level, it's these provincial associations. I think in New York it was Fujian mm. uh, province uh, there. So you have multiple actors. You have Ministry of State Security, which is the central government uh, there. But you also have these provincial level adjuncts of that. And they're all operating. And people need to get educated. I mean, one very good book that I would recommend to our audience is Alex Yoske's Spies and Lies, and sees mm -hmm. the extent of these networks. He's an Australian researcher. So it's not just the US. I mean, we see it in, 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 in Canada and uh, we were really are, are, are around the world. There was just a Financial Times article about the um, uh, uh, how in in uh, Belgium there was a, a network there and they were uh, bribing uh, political figures to uh, um, uh, you know, the spy work. But what was interesting is that. There was a, a very important researcher, Adrian Zenz, who's documented the repression of the Uyghurs and the genocide towards the Uyghurs. And that Financial Times article from just this morning talked about how they were targeting him, this research, to try to discredit him and <coughs> undermine yeah. him. Just so crazy. anyone who I think is engaged in a search for truth, and, and as we all should be, can be a target here. And and that just uh, you know underscores I think the the, the whole scope of the uh, of the problem. But yeah. but thank you again, Francis. Well, I think Pierre, you mentioned about the also the Chinese um, scholar associations and yeah. campuses. Um, I I I'm thinking of also the Chinese students associations, which you know exist in almost every U.S. campuses. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are also closely with, in touch with the embassy, right. and they can easily mobilize uh, students from different colleges to, you know, kind of stand up with them on certain occasions. Like for example, the APAC summits, mm -hmm. they actually asked um, students from Berkeley, from UCLA, and um, University of Southern California to all go, like you know, go up to San Francisco and to cheer and welcome Xi Jinping. Um, mm -hmm. And and not only they are asking these students to come, you know, out of their kind of patriotic, um, you know, respect, but also they're paying these people to attend and to be there and cheer the leader. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that alone is part of infiltration and, you know, that's a crime, like you said. Um, and not only in a campus setting, but also, you know, with businesses, accountability. Um, Actually, yesterday, with the announcement of the bounty, they also announced that um, the Hong Kong government has, um, the police have arrested a number of people who supported 
um, Ted Hui and Nathan Law mm -hmm. um, on platforms like Patreons and YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and these two <coughs> companies are mm -hmm. also, you know, U.S. companies. I'm, you know, I'll be curious to know uh, kind of the response from the, you know, Patreons um, mm -hmm. about how these people's information got out to the authorities. Um, but this also comes to the question about how we can hold, kind of hold them accountable and make sure that businesses are not exposing or uh, you, you know, sharing these information of their users um, and helping the CCP in um, you know, repressing people who are supporting freedom and democracy. And you know, simply for subscribing a person um, Patreon and you know yeah. to read their article and about their story, it's already a crime in Hong Kong. Yeah, well, you know I would venture to say like for all of our audience members online and in person, if you were to ask any of your friends that work on China-related issues or even human rights issues in Asia generally, I would bet you like nine out of ten folks had experienced some form of transnational mm -hmm. repression, whether it was like hacking of their email or bank accounts or whatever the case may be, or some form of intimidation at an event. Like this is so commonplace. And I think it's now, you know, rising to the surface just how severe and the great lengths like that are often gone to by the CCP, but also other authoritarian actors in general. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. And also, Francis, when you were sharing about the like Chinese student associations, I was thinking to myself, like, the Chinese government is robbing Chinese students of an authentic hmm. campus experience. Because I'm confident not every Chinese student wants to have to report to a Chinese embassy or wants to have to like engage in, you know, Chinese communist propaganda, but they might feel like they have to because they're worried about family back home or they're worried about their livelihood when they do have to return back. And I think that's really appalling that the Chinese government continues to engage in that form of intimidation. And I mean, remember, like people who go to college, you're like 18 years old. Um, so it's so young and for the government to be intervening in what should just be a very organic experience on campus is is really manipulative. <laughs> yeah, and you touch on a point about the age. Um, and in Hong Kong, actually, the national security law also requires schools to um, implement national security education and what they call a value education, which are all just patriotic values and um, brainwashing materials. Mm -mm. And imagine all the students, you know, primary school, elementary school students yeah. who are six who start from six years old they have to keep receiving those kind of education and every week actually every day they have to attend the flag raising ceremony to sing the anthem i've heard of parents sharing their stories about you know i'm so upset that my favorite song that you know like my son's favorite song is now the national anthem of the mm. prc wow. like that's the kind of things going on in classrooms in hong kong yeah. Um, and, and so you can imagine how, you know, how severe it is to the students who come up from mainland China as well. Yeah, like you know. 18 and below. Right, uh, yeah. That the brainwashing starts, like, instantly. Mm -hmm. That's such an important point. So we've talked generally about, like, policies to address mm -hmm. transnational repression and the specific instances that are occurring here. But now I want to just broaden our conversation a little bit more. Um, like, if there were one thing that could be done today by either the executive branch or Congress that you think would be most meaningful to the cause of freedom in Hong Kong, what would that be and why? So one thing that can be done is to uh, sanction. We have, the executive branch does have that sanctioning authority. And you know there's a saying in Chinese, um, Sa uh, ji jing ho, you know, to, to to kill a chicken to scare the monkeys, and <laughs> in Cantonese, okay, <laughs> Mandarin Cantonese, uh, and uh, so Monday I, I mentioned that there's a trial then that begins of, of Jimmy Lai, mm. um, and uh, it is there are three judges there again. These are judges that are undermining the rule of law that are acting to that, and if you want to send uh, send a message, and we should name names. That's Esther To Lieping, Alex Lee Wantang, and Susana Maria Dalmeida Remedios. They're the three judges that are going to be presiding over Jimmy Lai's trial. Mm. So if you want, you know, 
a, an immediate thing that could have an effect and could get people to think twice, because you, you do want to sort of shake people. What are you doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, so that would be, I think, just one sort of simple, precise uh, action that could be that could be taken, and and the executive branch has that authority uh, on multiple bases. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that's an important point because you know even though there is legislation that is you know on the hill um, from the legislative branch pressing for the the targeting of judges and prosecutors, anyone in the executive branch could wake up any day. Could have been yesterday. Could be tomorrow. That would be great. Um, and and sanction the the individuals who meet the legal definitions for sanctioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the fact that it could be done immediately is is such an important one to point out because there is a lot of things that I feel like Congress has needed to do because the administration has not taken up a lot of really important human rights challenges um, uh, in Asia, Hong Kong being one of them. Yeah, Francis. Well, I, I think Piero also touched on this, um, it's the outpost of the Chinese Communist Party. Mm. Um, that includes the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices. Um, there are three locations, three offices here in the US, and uh, like all of them, um, it's, they, it's New York, DC, New York, DC, San, San, Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah, um, they have been doing activities, events, you know, engagement with students, scholars, or business leader. This all sounds okay, like it's fine, but that's just a cover up of what they have been doing under the table, which is to you know ask the whereabouts of dissidents, of activists um, in the U.S., ask about you know try to find out where they are, and also you know, influence policymakers in their policy uh, around Hong Kong and, and China. Uh, they are basically an extended arm of the CCP and the Hong Kong government. Um, also, the um, Chinese secret police station, a lot of them are also kind of disguised as, you know, a local restaurant, a community center kind of thing. But in fact, they are spying over Chinese people here as well. Um, and so how, you know, the, the government, the administration need to commit into opening an investigation in all these outposts and making sure that we are shutting them down so that people like me, you know, other people who are freedom fighters, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Chinese dissidents here are able to continue to speak freely in this place. And I, I have been telling you know, media that I, I'm not really shaken up by you know, the bounty because the fact, that, the fact is they don't, Hong Kong governments do not have extraterritorial power to arrest us. But what they are going to do to kind of intimidate us is through the outposts that, that are located around us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what worry us is our personal safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like when we are walking on the street, we have to look around. When yeah. we are closing our door, we have to make sure it's locked. Yeah. We need to make sure the camera is on so that you know mm -hmm. nothing is happening in our house. That kind of thing is happening every day in our lives. I think that's most worrying, and um, it's something that you know governments, not only here in the U.S., the U.K. and Australia, and all the countries that are, you know, standing up for their citizens, they need to stand up against this egregious act of the Chinese government in spying over and, and harassing their own citizens mm -hmm. and people living in their country. Yeah, and I think when agents of the Hong Kong government, when agents of the CCP engage in the behaviors that you're describing, they have to be pursued to the fullest extent of U.S. law. They have to be charged when they engage in illegal activity. And I hope that we will see that. I think we've seen some good precursors to that, um, which is encouraging. Um, but I wanted to add, I'm taking moderator's prerogative here. I wanted to add <laughs> one other you know, sort of policy recommendation into the mix here. I think um, you know, while it's wonderful that we have folks like, um, like Francis here and Anna here, um, you know, many of our Hong Konger friends have pending asylum claims, and there are many more who, given how the Hong Kong government is persecuting on an even deeper level, may become refugees in the short term. 
And I think that looking at tools that the U.S. government has in its arsenal to offer permanent safe haven to Hong Kongers is a really important next step. And priority to refugee status would do just that. And I think that um, you know this is not an immigration issue. This is a humanitarian issue. These are people who are group members of a group of a special of special humanitarian concern, and they should be labeled as such. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to you know everything that you all have recommended, I think this is another step, especially that should be considered for um, those who may become targets or have already become targets because of their even their associations with um, people who have been targeted through the bounties. Um, so I want to give you guys an opportunity to maybe offer just a couple of final um, comments before we close here, and also tell us where we can find more information about the important work that each of you guys are doing in your separate capacities. Um, Francis. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think it takes a long, a little more time for a lot, you know, a lot of us to kind of process what's going on. Um, but as I said in my remark, I think the you know the recent issuance of bounties, two rounds of issuance of bounties, and the increasing arrest of people who support these overseas activists, mm -hmm. um, and also recently you know featuring political prisoners who like who are currently imprisoned in in jail, um, that they're being featured on citywide TV stations to confess that I have making a mistake. Hmm. I was influenced by, you know, pro-democracy values and I, I was wrong. Now I am getting better and I am a, a proud Chinese, that kind of thing. These are all tactics that are usually used in China and now it has come to Hong hmm. Kong. Yeah. I think that's a big sign for us to accept the fact that Hong Kong is no longer the Hong Kong that we know of. Um, it's becoming China's Hong Kong. And what that means is that we have to see it in a way that, you know, how we're looking at China, it's the same when we're looking at Hong Kong. It's, it's a place that it's ruled by law. Um, it's, it's a place that people have to fear mm -hmm. about what they say online and, and their, you know, cyber activities. And, and the freedom that we used to enjoy are no longer existing. And I think while we, we think about that, I, I think it's, it's important for us to kind of recognize the fact that um, Hong Kong is not getting better. Mm -hmm. And what we can do is to not only try to preserve the, the freedom that's left, but also to make sure that we don't um, enable the the, the, the trend and to uh, kind of help that trend going on, hmm. to, to stop that and to hold China accountable. Yeah. Um, and just one last word is that, again, don't forget about the people who are currently most persecuted in Hong Kong. Hmm. I think um, people who have, you know, the bountied individuals, all of them would agree with me that a lot of the things that we are going through are nothing compared to the people who are um, now in jail, yeah. um, and we never know what they're going through. Yeah. Um, but the less that they want us uh, and want the world to to think is that they um, is being forgotten, and yeah. um, that they're they're not, you know, the world is not paying attention yeah. to what's going on in Hong Kong. I think all of us need to remember their names and to make sure that their story is being heard. Yeah. Yeah. And also um, at uh, the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation, you guys have a political prisoner database that like has their pictures, has information about them. And I think that's a really great resource to folks who are wanting to learn more. And I know CCC also mm -hmm. has um, their political prisoner database. Um, and I think HKDC also has a really useful resource. But I think, especially with Jimmy's trial coming up, like keeping Jimmy Lai um, in our thoughts and in our prayers is so important over like the coming weeks. Because I think a lot of people forget Jimmy is um, on the older end of things, mm. um, he's not always in the best of health, and he's in solitary like most yeah. of the time. He's, act I think, yeah. he's the actually the oldest um, political prisoners in Hong, in Hong Kong. Kong. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, so I think keeping him in mind is, is really important over the next several weeks. Yeah. Piero? Yeah, no, I just want to say to Francis that, uh, you know, and you know, we've got your back and, you know, continue to be, be bold and be not afraid and, and to uh, Joey and Anna and all those other people who've been, been targeted. And uh, certainly you have many friends in the U.S. Congress at the Congressional Executive Commission on China. We're also working with the Select Committee uh, as, as well. So, you know, Chairman Smith and the CECC, Chairman Gallagher and our mm -hmm. Democratic counterparts. Uh, uh, as, as well to stand up for uh, for that, uh, um, uh, Senator Merkley, uh, uh, Congressman Krishnamurthy. So I think it's it's a sort of uh, we, we we do have your 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 back. And for folks that are interested in learning more about this, yes, you mentioned the political prisoner database, mm -hmm. which the CECC has. Again, it's on our website, CECC.gov. It's more comprehensive because it covers all of of <laughs> China, but it also includes Hong Kongers. And then our annual report on China's human rights record, which also includes uh, Hong Kong. And we did, in last May, uh, there was a uh, hearing that we did on Hong Kong that I referenced before, which the transcript is there and people can watch it. I would refer people to that, and also a number of special reports that we did, including one that identifies prosecutors and another one that identifies judges who were involved in this uh, undermining of the, the rule of law in using law as a tool of, of mm -hmm. repression against people that are standing up for, for fundamental freedoms and fundamental rights like Francis. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. great. Well, thank you to everybody who is able to join us here online and also in person. Um, and a special thanks to both Francis and Piero for joining here in person and sharing your important insights. Um, for those who are interested in learning more about Hudson Institute and um, our work, you can go to hudson.org. Um, and I have many colleagues that work on these issues um, and are happy to shine a spotlight on this. But for now, um, to all those who are in Hong Kong, we remember you um, daily. And we wish for those who are behind bars that they would be set free. And for those who are not behind bars, that they would enjoy more of the freedoms that they once enjoyed uh, prior to the national security law going into effect. So thank you all for joining us.